It's us again, more Poet the Poet, and now we have Mark Nichols. Um, you, Robert. Hey, uh, one of the hot discoveries in Radapalax <coughs> by George Dickinson. And let's see, you've been writing poems since the tender age of 14 when William Carlos Williams made you feel like you could do it too. That's right, that's right. Um, write poems or deliver <laughs> babies? Uh, no, he didn't haven't, del- haven't done, any, done any babies, no. Uh, he, he didn't deliver you by any chance, did he? <laughs> no, no, he, he was in New Jersey and I was in Michigan, so um, that was the difference. He did make house calls, you see. Uh, <laughs> let's see, you've... Uh, Stole my plums, actually. Uh, I see. Yeah. All right, we'll get into that. And he left me a note, you know. What did he say? (laughs) Sorry. Something like that. Boy, that's the pits, I tell you. (laughs) Uh, And you've worked a number of of, uh, peculiar jobs. That's right. And you've even been an actor. Uh, Yes. And you've worked in retail books. A lot. In a store, I hope. Yes, that's right. Uh, Yeah. Not on, not not an Astor place. Oh, okay. Uh, You mentioned that for a reason, didn't you? Did I? You're leading up to something. <laughs> yes. I, I see it right there in front of me. All right, read the poem. We'll get back to this in a minute. <laughs> okay, well, we had an urban violence poem uh, on, uh, on the program earlier about Beirut. This one's about New York. Mm-hmm. Just a little background. In the year 1849, there was a riot. It was just commemorated, actually, at the Cooper Union uh, on uh, Monday, uh, called the Astor Place Opera House Riot. And there was an opera house there, and there was a rivalry between two actors. One was Ned Forrest, who was the darling of the Bahoys, uh, the contingent of Irish young men. And then there was uh, Charles McCready, who was an English actor. At any rate, there was this rivalry between them, and there was this enormous riot, mob surrounding the theater, and troops were called, and shots were fired into the crowd, killing over 20 people. Uh, There's a Starbucks uh, Starbucks, uh, there now, and a a kiosk. And... um, At any rate, here's the poem. In 1849, there's still the brown smell of a living river or the sea. I'm hearing musket fire on Astor Place, just downtown from where Broadway goes awry, a distant rending sheet that hangs in piggy lanes near empty lots with rocking fescue. Blue cirrus day. The men in soap locks and high hats have throaty chants when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that dovetail nicely with the Celtic need to lose. Shakespeare is a Sligo name. A stench of nitre when the muskets loose a cloud like from a Chinese laundry. Megan smiles and smokes, her mocha beading in a plastic cup. She doesn't hear the wails and curses in the breezeway of the coffee shop. And I'm a haunt, gauzy, airborne, hovering, insinuated in these creases in the air. And everything that ever happened happens now. The curtained sunset fire suspended in the street, the shying horses, the melancholed stone. I can't help but do it sound a little Irish in there because of that when the hurly-burly's done. Apparently they were even chatting, chanting uh, lines from Macbeth while they attacked the theater. So. Uh, it just goes to show you, you go to Beirut, you come back to New York, there's no peace whatsoever, no matter That's what right. town you go to. That's right. Let's see. You say you write about, the, about music and the experience of listening. Yes, I do. And I do. the past. Uh, mm-hmm. What song was playing in the background of this one? Oh, of this particular one? Yeah. I don't know. I've been listening to a lot of bagpipes lately, but ah. I don't know. They're what they were playing at the time. But Turkey okay. in the Straw, maybe, I don't know. On the bagpipes? <laughs> <laughs> Probably just on, oh, what do they call it, the chanter? <laughs> that part. Um, let's see, you've won a few prizes in your time. Uh, yeah, a couple years ago I, wrote, I won a prize called the Milton Dorfman Poetry Prize. Uh-huh. And, um, and that was the most money I ever made on a poem, actually. $30? No, it was actually $500. It was nice, yeah. I'm hanging I don't around. have that one with me. I'm hanging uh, around with the wrong <laughs> people. <laughs> $500. Okay, the Dyer Ives Foundation? Oh, that was in, that was in back in Michigan, in, mm-hmm. in Kent County. That was a county-wide award sponsored by that foundation. And Hunter College? Yeah, I, I took some classes there a few years ago and submitted some poems. I, oh, all right. And, uh, you have another one uh, up in the box. Sure. Well, you mentioned uh, music. Mm-hmm. This is a poem that's actually uh, in Radapalax in the first issue. Uh, it's called This Kindled by Gaude Virgo Salutata. 
a motet by John Dunstable, circa 1400. And uh, that's a, uh, obviously a medieval piece of music, a motet with five voices. Uh, and here it goes. Slow spreading English music, as though we watched a pale drawing off of the night from delicate fields and heard a haunt of griffins in a fog close by the house. How one of the griffins without fire has wrought by a concentration of time, a face in gnarled elmwood with a spell hidden in its hands to warp, to whirl the wood, to make water freeze and thaw and invisibly fade, to make fire ash, to make fire even without fire, and carve an eddy in the air that turns his maneuver into a major wind, kissing the barn wood high up, overfilling the air over the ocean, causing a wrinkle in the salt drift engendering, engendering thunder. How a griffin loves with his hands the way we walk without shoes after winter, painfully, for the first time in a year. But after all this is spoken of, it is the tenderness I haven't stolen for this poem. The griffins droning after the rain, touching the wood to make a face in the bowl of a tree. Another hybrid, one being falling into someone else. And as if poetry and poetry prizes weren't enough, you're working on a novel. I That's right. Called Sumac, I think. Uh, I speak for George here, and when I say we have a real itch to read it. <laughs> well, is, it's, a, it's a prominent uh, shrub in uh, Michigan, and I'm sure as it is in all temperate zones. But yeah, I've been working on it for a while, and it's going pretty well. What's it about? What's it about? Well, it takes place mostly in uh, the year 1906 and 1907. It has a little bit of everything in it, a little, uh, uh, you know, table wrapping and spiritualism and things like that. Um, a lot of nature. I hope that when you open the book, uh, bees and pine needles will fall out of it. Um, a little murder, a little murder towards the end. Actually, there was a, uh, there was a murder that occurred in my family in 1906. Uh, a great grandmother's sister sort of gave me the idea to write uh, the book, although that's not the main point of the novel. But um, uh, is George in it? He's played a lot of uh, law murderous. enforcement. Yeah. George will be in the movie. Actually. Okay. <laughs> He's played a lot of law enforcement uh, agents. So yeah, that's, uh, I, as I've, a dead body. I've I been hope. thinking uh, Nick Nolte and George and a few others. Uh, mm. I'll have my people call his people, and we'll see in what fact, we can come up with. I'd rather be arrested by George than anybody else I can think of. <laughs> how about another? Speaking poem of before, being arrested, no. Before actually. he hauls me off uh, down to the station house, how about another poem? Sure. This poem is called Train. It's about a, a train trip I took down to uh, New Orleans on the city of New Orleans, which uh, had a, they had an accident on that train a, a couple months ago. But uh, this was before that, and we got to New Orleans in one piece. Um, we barely left in one piece, but <laughs> it's called uh, Train. Illinois, the green sea sleeping. Chicago papers rustling at our feet, turning brown with age in 50 miles. They tell us what a violent land we live in, but this train is like a laundromat on wheels, the same benign code of looking and looking away. I am held captive as a shirt, tumbling. One could almost learn to like this long, sweet grieving of the nothing to be done. Pairs of eyes are watching as I saunter to the club car for one more tin-canned margarita. Across the aisle, two young married Parsis, immaculate in white, are folded one into the other with two red suns between them, one burning on each forehead. Do you remember that they slept for almost 14 hours, or maybe one whole day between them, two suns on either side? They were still sleeping early afternoon, next afternoon, when Europeans and other thin white cranes finally dipped their beaks between the kudzu leaves and up from crossword puzzles, and outside people left their cars to watch the train pass by, airless and sufficient, float past their houses, down Mississippi's thigh, down to the blood flower, where Tennessee wrote plays, watched boys, sold mammy dolls and postcards in fluorescent morgue light on St. Peter. Meanwhile, the tracks were curving. 
I saw the moon first there, then there, then over there, and then the red roads gray with tarmac, two colors merging like the color of a brain. That is, something irredeemably polite paved over something seething, something raw, something hidden in a wave or a handshake, in a kiss. And you were sleeping too, with your flying gift for regular oblivion, mouth slightly open, plates like garden snakes stealing down your brow, waking and looking out long after midnight at gritty downtown Memphis, an exhausted movie set. And then you slept again, and then it grew so strange to haunt the sleeping train, lights haloed and horrific in the glass, infants tossed like casualties on their mothers, lovers on each other, and even bored night porters nodding, novels whispering on their knees. I couldn't hear or smell outside, and black leaves gusted toneless in the wind, plangent maybe, under railroad bridges, over rivers we kept crossing. No, the same river, stars in left-hand glass, heat lightning in the right. I've had subway rides like that. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a, a long ride. And I guess so. Do you have any uh, advice to people who want to win poetry prizes? <laughs> uh, enter. <laughs> Often. <laughs> that sounds like the old boating advice. Yeah, I don't have a lot of advice for that. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's uh, the luck of the draw. I see. What's the strangest thing that ever happened to you at a reading? The strangest thing? Besides this, well, one, I think I mean. this is the strangest. No, I. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that, we, we can't nominate ourselves. It doesn't count. Oh gosh, mm, I can't really think of anything. Um, mm -hmm. If there's a reading coming up shortly, perhaps you can show up. You can think of something between then and now, and you can show up and, and uh, make it the strangest reading mm -hmm. you've ever had. Let's see. I was attended a reading where somebody stripped while reading a Walt Whitman poem once, but uh, I had no. I didn't, it seems, I didn't do anything. I don't know. I, I think that would only help the Whitman poems. <laughs> I know a couple of teenage magicians out in Queens who take off their clothes while doing their magic. Have you ever done anything like that? No, 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 and not today. <laughs> oh, well. Well, Mark Nichols, I want to thank you for coming on Poet the Poet, and of course, thanks to George Dickerson. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert. And his work. Do we have... And I think we have a moment. I will, uh, I will cheat and throw on another little goodie of mine, a 911. Desert canoe over exertion, sunstroke. And while you call 911, <laughs> we're going to fade out. Thank you for watching. <laughs>